question for the Czech of community. Uh, uh, so, I, it, am I right that the Czech of community is not that big in, in, in the world? So maybe it's a bit more in the United States or Europe, I don't know, so I'm not sure at all. So, but uh, it's my impression and I, I wonder what the reason might be for that. Or uh, what it, it's uh, because when I was in, U in the United States, I always, you know, noticed this uh, fight between the schools, so to say, you know. So, uh, and I wonder what's going on there, or the, what reasons are going on in, in terms of, uh, of, of uh, that work. Uh. It's a very interesting time for the Chekhov community as the world goes on a global perspective. The Michael Chekhov's work is blossoming and growing in places all over the world. When in 1990 there were just literally perhaps 100 people in the world who were working with Michael Chekhov's work. And a handful of people launched by Jorg Andres and Jörg Schlanghans who gathered together for the first international Michael Chekhov conference ever uh, in 92 in Berlin. People from this expanse, and it was very much like collecting uh, spies, <laughs> secret agents who were working with Michael Chekhov, and most of whom didn't know that there were other people out in the world that were working to bring this material forward. And that group of people that came together in 1992 were so excited and honored to be able to find other people who loved the work of Mr. Chekhov. But the ability to communicate what was the work of Mr. Chekhov was very difficult. Uh, language and culture limitations created many boundaries and the perspective of the work itself transformed over the history of Mr. Chekhov's own life in his travels from his work in Moscow through into Berlin, into Paris, Latvia, Lithuania, England, the East Coast of the United States, then the West Coast of the United States, the processes that actors were needing to learn changed from, and, and the way in which one was going to work with actors changed. So from the Moscow Art Theater where you were basically going to spend a lifetime working with a group in the 1920s, 19 teens and 20s, now it evolved that you were going to be working with constantly changing groups. Maybe you were going to have a group for a while like he did in Dartington from 36 to the end of 1938. And, uh, but the way history and the socio-political structures on in, unfolded. <clears throat> Michael Chekhov's own students and their needs and his own career kept changing. And so he kept changing how and what he was teaching in two major ways. One was he had an interest in the spiritual pathway of the actor. And it was his emerging from a deep psycho-spiritual crisis, a period uh, of, uh, of insanity, uh, some consider it, uh, incapable of, of functioning. And it was a spiritual pathway out of that, very strongly through Rudolf Steiner's work, 
that enabled him to come to grips with the role of the artist. He was a wildly popular artist, the most famous. He had curtain calls that were sometimes hours long. And to understand how you could be so wildly famous for playing on the stage when people were killing themselves over loaves of bread and over political opinions was very difficult for him to understand. And only through this higher perspective was he able to come to grips with the gift that he had. And he made a commitment to want to bring that gift from the spiritual perspective into the artist. And that, as he did that, he gained more and more en enemies in the Soviet Union. And this question of how much to reveal of the spiritual activity that he drew into his acting technique uh, became, in my opinion, uh, a pressure that wasn't gone once he escaped the, the Soviet. It, it continued. He had this brief period of two and a half years in Dartington where he was free, but the war and when he moved to America, the pressures of commercialism and the lack of willingness by publishers from 1942 when he tried to publish his book, censoring basically the spiritual content. And those people, so those people who were closest to Michael Chekhov, especially in the end, adopted, in my opinion, a fear also of outwardly and publicly speaking the spiritual underpinnings. And this goes to this question about the conditions today in, in the world because there are separate uh, groups who retain the perspective that it's not appropriate to be obvious, blatant, and boldly speaking of the spiritual content. And they object to anyone who does. And it is in my opinion that they are afraid. Uh, they, they have the same vibration of fear that, that they got from Michael Chekhov, whose fear developed from some very real uh, dangers. Russian emigre artists were being assassinated, and he was attacked and accused of, uh, you know, of causing people's deaths because he left, and he had to leave because of his spiritual beliefs. So there were some real consequences, and his own paranoia, uh, I think, was adopted by some of those near him, who then went on much later to teach and retained that. And, but in this group that came together in 1992 and continued to, to work, there were impulses and there were people, myself included, who were not willing to adopt a silence regarding the spiritual content. Uh, personally, I feel it's part of my destiny to end the silence. And I also feel it's part of the destiny of that small group of people who came together, who then carried the work of that organization, uh, which included Jorg, included Sarah Kane, included a number of people who are still working to this day, who, who feel safe acknowledging the spiritual content. It's not that we have to run around pounding it into people. 
but I do feel that the world has transformed and we have helped transform that world. It has been a mission of mine and it has been a mission of other people to get more people to know about Michael Chekhov. And however, it did go in two branches. The, the other problem be, besides the question of whether or not it was acceptable to be spiritual was it was um, what I would call commercialism um, and, and two areas of commercialism that caused challenges. One was anyone who that there was a certain set of people who objected to applying Michael Chekhov's work to anything but the theater because to apply it to, to film, to commercials, to making money in the entertainment industry was somehow sacrilegious and somehow inappropriate. And there's a, a rumor that Mr. Chekhov hated film. And there's a foundation for that belief system because in the beginning he did not like his own performances because they were overacted. They were, he started in silent movies and they were very, very big. Very, and he was a brilliant clown, so they were very big. And, and he, he was traumatized by that. But Mr. Chekhov had this, I want to fall in love with the problem policy. And by the time he worked into Hollywood, by the time he got into the late 40s and and early 50s, he had found a way to fall in love with film. And so anyone who was in touch with him prior to this time when he fell in love with film had the opinion that he hated film, including some of his students who made their careers in the movies subsequently and used Michael Chekhov in their careers they themselves had their own opinion of that it's not appropriate to be using it on, on camera or f for commercials or, or whatever. And so that was another problem because, uh, because some of us, myself included, made our living on camera using Michael Chekhov's work and, uh, and I personally felt it was important to teach practical application. And it was very useful for commercials and very useful for clowning and very useful for every, every area. So that uh, also created some uh, problems, judgments, that made people not want to associate with certain people because of how, uh, how they were applying the work, whether they were using it for anything other than theater. And another area of the commercialism question is literally economics. So there became a question of what was an organization to offer to a participant who was paying to attend? Was a participant who was coming to attend an international festival entitled to be given a complete overview of the work? Or was it okay if someone came to a international festival and got a little bit of checkoff applied to commercials, a little of it applied to clowning, a little applied to mask work, a little applied to uh, a monologue, a little applied with no cohesive pedagogy, separate teachers teaching their own understanding, with no one looking at or overseeing the, the entire experience of the participant. So what in these international <coughs> gatherings, we were offering smorgasbords. We were offering 
taste this, have a taste of that. Um, this chef is offering you that. This chef, this is the Chekhov chef who specializes in desserts. And this chef specializes in appetizers. And, uh, but you, you never get a full menu. So you have an amazing experience, but you don't walk away with uh, the ability to bring it forward. So some people didn't want to create a cohesive pedagogy because they didn't have one. And so because they didn't have one, because they're special, they were known for their specialty, and their specialties were getting them invited places. So if they gave too much away and created other teachers, then they would lose opportunities. And so they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to give enough that they could be replaced. And some of us, have absolute faith that the more people who we can support to have a clear way of working with the work, a comprehensive understanding and pedagogy, that more people we can give this gift to, the more people can bring it out into the world. Uh, we, we are not afraid of inspiring and training teachers and signing our name to say, yes, I have given you and you have received and you have demonstrated that you have received and are able to bring that forward. And so, so this is where that commercial, how to survive, how to thrive, how to protect my own, a certain group of us never felt possessive about the work. We're always looking to move it forward. And, uh, and a certain group felt they needed to protect how they're doing it and, and not necessarily bring it out. And so those groups find it difficult to merge. Mm -hmm. right. One, one path is, uh, or the path that I, I seek to employ myself is to follow Michael Chekhov's technique to teach the technique and to share the technique, to operate out of his principles of love, out of his principles of giving, and out of the belief that it's, it's not Michael Chekhov we're deifying, it, it's the gift that he gave us that uh, he invites us to respect our creative individuality as actors and we must respect it as teachers, as organizations. We must respect the creative individual, individuality of an organization. So I feel that there's an absolute blessing in having international conferences that don't offer a cohesive pedagogy that offer a social opportunity for people to come together and exchange and meet from all over the world. But that alone does not create the sufficient information, skill, pedagogy, structure, large enough overview to then just participate in that and, and open up a check off studio uh, in my opinion and and there's clearly an impulse that uh, you know, I began this process of educating and training teachers in the early 90s and uh, and since then other organizations have seen the need to also create a clear pedagogy. It doesn't mean they can't come together in an international environment. So that's what I'm working for. Um, that's what I, that's a dream that I have. It was a dream for me to see Chekhov 
blossoming all over the world. Part of the problem that I had in Hollywood was that my students would not put it on their resumes because they wanted to keep it a secret. They felt so empowered they didn't want to tell anyone. And I didn't realize this for, for a long time. And, and then I started having to, you know, say, look, <laughs> please put my name on your resume and put the Michael Chekhov studio on your resume. Put the You Have Trained in Michael Chekhov technique. And, and please operate from love. Don't operate out of fear. Mm. Share this. Imagine what it would be like if you could be in a television ensemble series with a whole group of people who understood what atmosphere was, who could understand what molding, flowing, flying, radiating, who were safe with tempo and rhythm changes like that, you know? Can you imagine being able to be in, uh, you know, in a commercial with people who understood Chekhov? Uh, che commercials are all about atmosphere just about creating an atmosphere associated with the product. It, it, it's so simple, it's so easy, creating an ensemble theater company that truly would create and work to create this. And to be, can you imagine being able to come together, bring people from all over the world together for a month and truly create a, a show because everyone had a, a somewhat common understanding of what the work is, it would be amazing, amazing. So um, for me, I think uh, it's growing in terms of the harmony. I believe the harmony is, uh, is improving. It's something I'm personally working on because I was personally very much involved in the the conflict because I am blatantly spiritual and blatantly commercial. Both. So, and practical and pedagogical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Does that give you a, mm. an idea? Yeah. There are now uh, Chekhov teachers in, in, in all over the world. So it's now growing. It's still, even in the United States, it's still not a mainstream technique. We're still looking to help people understand there's a person named Michael Chekhov who's different from Anton Chekhov and that it's a, a body, mind, spirit orientation. In the United States, the first way in, in many university trainings, is through the movement departments. So they're bringing it in as a movement yeah. technique. And I think it's also interesting there are other movement uh, techniques coming in from the dance world that have, that I believe Mr. if Mr. Chekhov's work were known, I don't think you'd need those. I, I don't think you'd need things like viewpoints and, and um, uh, other things coming from the dance world if you had Chekhov trained actors who understand space, backspace, line, form, who understand these things. Mr. Chekhov's technique goes to train the completely independent creative artist who can move from the actor to the director to the designer and uh, through the lens of the actor be always working in collaboration with, right, be able to help the director know and offer suggestions and be able to inspire designers and be receptive to, to all of that. Mm. Because Chekhov had indications for all the, all the different, every aspect of the, uh, of the production. So if I'm a new teacher, and so you're saying that it's, for your opinion, it's better if I'm going to teach new uh, students, new actors to this approach, it's better for me to do like five days workshop of like overview 
instead of taking atmospheres and work for five days. That's yes, regarding the uh, a way for a teacher to bring a new group of, of, of actors to Michael Chekhov. I do believe that it is better to give uh, an overview and give them some context rather than go into one particular tool very heavily. It, two things come to mind. The famous um, parable about the blind, the blind men and the elephant so, you know, there's how many blind men? Mm -hmm. uh, and they're all touching an elephant. One has the tail, mm -hmm. and, and one has a tusk, mm -hmm. and one has the trunk. You know, one has the toenail, one has a leg. And they're all sitting there going, oh, yeah, so this is an elephant. Right? One has the ear. They all have a very different experience of the elephant. If you only know the elephant by touching its tail, or you only know the elephant by touching the tusk, it will be a very different animal. And so that's one you know, ancient bit of wisdom to help us understand that if a person went to a workshop and only experienced one tool, that it would not necessarily give them an experience of the whole. Another is studies done on the cultivation of genius, interviewing people who are geniuses in mathematics, in music, in art, in athletics, whatever it is, studying what they had in common in their training process. So what they noticed was in their first exposure to the area, their coaches, whether it's their parents or someone else or teacher or whatever, focused on creating enthusiasm. Get them to enjoy it, have fun with it. Get them to want to do it. If the person continues wanting to do it, they will begin to want to do it better. And then you start giving them more specific, more specific direction, more specific guidance, more specific techniques. If they get good, if they take those techniques and work with them and become very good, so if we talk about a pianist, the first thing you want is get the child to love music. Get them to love making noise on the piano. And then if they want to, they will get better at it. They will want to know, how do I get my finger over here? How do I do that? Then you show them techniques. And when they can play Chopin very well, if they really want to be better, then you bring them into the le level of mastery training. And mastery training is when you want to go from excellence to genius, is when you take the whole and you break it down to parts smaller than recognizable. So for that pianist, now you sit them on the piano and you have them play a B flat 100 times and try to produce 100 different tones out of it. And when they can make that move 100 different ways, for us, that's when you can expand 100 different ways, when you can contract 100 different ways, when you can mold a new molding every time you mold. When every time a center is given you, that center gives you a new impulse and you're able to use the same center a hundred days and keep a completely improvisational, that's mastery. That's when genius starts to come. When you go back and play Chopin now, now it has something well beyond anything that could be written on the page. 
So, so these are concepts that I embrace in my training. The, my first thing is I want you to have fun. If you have fun and you have fun exploring and it's not so exactly perfect, it's not the absolute, you know, most amazing thing, but you're having fun and it's different and it's opening you up, you'll want to come and have more. And you'll get in that fun just a little teeny spark of a real moment. And when you get that taste, yeah, then you want to get technique. And when you have an overview, a strong base from a program that's created with a feeling of the whole, then going to an event where you spend 45 minutes making sure that you're, you're above space and your side space and your back space are really connected, then you don't mind spending 45 minutes doing that. But if you walked in, if you walked into class and you didn't know what Chekhov was and someone asked you to stand still for 45 minutes and imagine these rays going out. Bye bye Chekhov. <laughs> I don't know. So trying to get someone to to get the concept perfectly right in the beginning for me uh, uh, is, isn't the way I would work. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, it's a, it's, it's a problem of our time somehow because, you know, there's so uh, very few uh, possibilities out there, or the people, uh, actors and actresses are so in their functionality because you have to function in a very short amount of time, you know, in order to, to I don't know, to, to, to get successful or mm -hmm. to keep your success and so on and so on, that they are not uh, willing to retrain, really to commit to, to a constant training anymore. So, and I think that's a, that's a huge problem. I, I do think that that lack of willingness, um, the professional, the life of the actor is so overwhelming. The struggle to try and stay uh, fresh or to take a pause and really gain uh, new skill sets and refresh. Uh, however, uh, e and that is even more why um, this get people's enthusiasm. You know, in, in my work I, I say, go be a bad actor, do this, overact do this, overact, and, uh, and get this need to be perfect out of your system very quickly because, oh, and, and if a working actor takes a break and is given permission to be bad and act freely, it is such a relief that uh, sometimes just even just a weekend of relief of encouraging them to go crazy allows them to come back to what they were doing with a new love. One of the biggest gifts the checkoff technique can do is reactivate the the love. Um, help help working actors reconnect with the love that brought them into the industry. And there's no other major acting technique that speaks so clearly about the love in our profession and the use of it as a practical tool, that it is absolutely something that is intangible, we can't touch it, but when we engage it as an act, as a verb, uh, not, not, as a, not as a feeling, but as a verb, um, that it activates our charisma.
and it frees our talent. And when we recognize how much we love, it restores our sense of purpose as an artist. You know, what Mr. Chekhov was looking for when he had his crisis is, I think, the same thing that cost Robin Williams his life. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that um, our, you know, the way the culture responds to artists is painfully unhealthy. And so we as artists have to embrace, if we can embrace a technique like Michael Chekhov's, with teachers who are really holding responsibility for the higher, the higher good. And Mr. Chekhov, when George Stanov was um, walking down the street with Mr. Chekhov one day, and he was complaining, saying to him, you know, what are we doing, making better actors for Louis B. Mayer? And Mr. Chekhov said, no, doctor. He called him doctor because he was very professorly. And um, he said, we're helping people become healthier, happier human beings. And when we hold that, we know we're working with the whole human being. And that if we can get the whole human being to engage the love that they have, the talent will express itself and the techniques will fall into place. The, the, you know, the, the life will be, be much happier and the artwork that they create will continue to uplift and inspire. We have so much performance that is denigrating, that is destructive. It's, it's, it tears, the, uh, tears humanity down and we need to render evil. We need to show the forces of good and evil fighting. But we show that, we render that through love. We love our evil characters. We love our good characters. We love the characters who support and bystand. And we love the audiences. Didn't you guys love the, we had an audience yeah, today. Yeah. How happy were we when they showed up, right? Oh, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, it, 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 it was the best, the best. And how many times do actors sit backstage and go, oh, the audience is a bad audience today. Mm. They're, they're creating a field of separation between the spectator and the artist just by the artist having a critical perspective. And that basically comes out of the fear that they aren't good enough. So they reflect that outward, that the audience wasn't good enough, because it's easier to think that it was a bad audience than that I was bad. When you act out of love, you and Mr. Chekhov's work, I think one of the greatest gifts it gave me was it gave me the ability to keep loving myself even when I was a bad actor. When I had a day that wasn't so brilliant, when I messed up an audition or something like that, when I dropped a line and things didn't go so well, I was no longer beating myself up and angry and in pain and in fear that it meant that I had no talent. Mr. Chekhov never doubts our talent and encourages us to understand that our love the love we bear is the talent. Yeah. You couldn't possibly have the love unless you had the talent. Yeah, it mirrors how unfree this whole industry basically is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lisa, you, um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about how you've used the techniques in your professional work as a film actor. You gave, um, you were a guest actor in an HBO series that I loved, yeah. which is very much about a battle between good and evil called Carnivale. Yes. Um, and you played Mrs. Crabbe in that, I remember. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So in Carnival, the story has a, a young man played by Nick Stahl who has the ability to heal with hands-on healing. And, but it, the energy 
is drawn from somewhere else. So in the very first episode, there was a little lame girl being carried in a red wagon. And he healed her, and a whole field of corn, I think it was, dried up, withered up, and shoo, And it takes place in the Depression, 1930s, in the southwest of the United States. And, um, and so the, this question of how to handle responsibility, taking who to heal and at what price, what price would be paid if I use my gifts? And so in the third episode, her grandmother, me, Mrs. Crab, is walking, trying to fig find out how and who it was that healed my little girl. And the, uh, so two things, funny stories. So the scene for the audition have, is the moment where my granddaughter and I have been walking and walking for days, very hot and exhausted, and we finally get to a town where we see, she says, there he is, Grandma, there he is. And I go into this, bless me, oh my God, praise the Lord, there he is, this man saved my girl, made her to walk, she was lame and he made her to walk. And I go off on this big, and I'm, I, I build into hysteria. And the result of this hysteria is that the town swarms him and starts mobbing him so they can be healed. And the story of the episode is that ultimately the town won't set the carnival that he's now a part of. They won't let them set up in the town because carnivals have a bad name. But because of this moment, they decide they can make uh, money by creating a tent revival and pretending that he's a healer. And so they, they wound up doing this whole thing. So my big scene is this moment when I go crazy recognizing him. And in the audition, I was, uh, I knew the casting director well, and he brought me straight into the callback, and the callback had about six people in a tiny little room. So literally, they were, they were just like this, and there was barely room for me to stand, and the casting director was, was sitting in a chair, and I was here, and these people were literally right here, and, and in this small room, and, and I, well, of course, was going through this big expansion from falling, I'm falling, it's hot, dragging, falling, and then this, ah, this transition, there he is, oh my God, there he is, hey everybody, hey everybody, and just go escalating up. And, and, and I'm starting to paw him, and the casting director starts, is going, it, uh, like, like, this, like this, like this, and I thought he was going, take it down, you're too big, you're too, I thought he was cueing me <laughs> that I was being too big because the room was so small. <laughs> and so I, you know, I dropped down, I kept the intensity, but I dropped it down and, <laughs> you know, and I came down on my knees and, uh, and afterwards he walked me out and, and I said, um, Thank you for, you know, and he goes, he said, what? <laughs> and I said, well, you were, you, you wanted me to, he said, no, 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 I was just acting with you. <laughs> so it was pretty funny. But the script had praise God, praise the Lord, bless the Lord, praise Jesus, every other word, you know, a sentence, a little bit of information, and more praise, bless, Lord Jesus, uh, thank the, praise, bless, thank, but all the, over and over and over again. And I worked so hard trying to get the Lord and the <laughs> Jesus and the praise and the bless and the exact, 
and I rehearsed it with all the different tempo and rhythms. Very slowly, bah, 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 really quickly. And I just went up and down and up and down, kept flipping it back and forth. Well, I get onto the set and they're running late. And uh, they're, they're, uh, they were two hours late, running two hours behind schedule. The first part, they're really shooting on Nick, and he wants me to go very slowly and very gradually, when, when I make the recognition, very gradually. And as so we do this a number of times, very, very gradually, and then he comes over to me and he says, do you, do you think this is overwritten? Do you think it's got too many? And I went, I do. And he said, do you think you could cut it? I could. Good. So we're going to go to lunch. And when we come back, let's try it again. So at lunch, I trimmed it, cut it. I took all the important points because I had analyzed it, knew where my climaxes were, the key turns, and trimmed it. And now the camera was on me. And I did one time slowly, like we did it before. And then he said, okay, now I want you to go zoom like this. And no problem, because I was so prepared. And I did it, and we did the, the close-ups, and we did the, the and, and then he says, okay, we're, we're done. And the uh, assistant director came over and said, do you need any inserts? Is there anything else? Do you need another angle? He said, no. And he said, what about this? He said, no, we got what we needed. No, no, we're done. And, and, and he, and the director turned to the uh, assistant director who kept asking about more and, and he finally said, you know, why are you asking me this? And he said, well, we're ahead of schedule now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, it was great. And that's, it's just because I did the work. I did, it was a strong preparation. It made the action effortless. It made the set, everyone on the set, much happier. I really knew the text. I knew it well enough to be able to adjust it. I was able to be consistent after I made the cuts. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was very satisfying. And, um, and they added extra days for me. And I mean, you see in that, <laughs> In that tent scene, I mean, they really, yeah, you're really pop, you're really they ready, really, they, 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 everyone's in beige, and you know, faded colors, and they got me in this black and this, you know, I'm like this star, and they just, and I'm radiating, yeah. So it's very, they were very generous, and it was just the most fun set. They were wonderful, the costumers and the food and the wonderful actors and. Was great. Um, th w w another really interesting uh, job was working on ER with um, Noah Wiley, and it was Noah's last episode as a series regular on ER. And in ER, they would have one continuous shot, and the shots would be sometimes five minutes long. And your piece would be just 30 seconds here and come back another 30 seconds here, come back another 30 seconds there. And the director would ask you what you wanted to do there. And then the rest of the time, all those other three and a half minutes or whatever, you, you made up your own story because you would be in the background. And so it was, uh, so I'm working with Noah Wiley in my scene, and I was a nurse bringing a young girl uh, who had injured her hand, uh, 
at the school. I'm a school nurse, and uh, or, or her foot. I guess it was her foot that was injured. So I have her in. A, I'm pushing her in a wheelchair. It's been a long day, so I'm using falling again. And um, and when I they bring her over near the table where she's going to get up and, and sit. And it's up to me what to do. And so I just fell down to her foot and I just fall and help her down there with her legs. So falling told me what to do. And then I, then I went behind her. Um, so she was sitting on the table. I was over her shoulder, which is always a great position to be in. She's going to be the focal point. And, um, and Noah is here, so now what do I do? She, he has to take off um, various you know, socks, whatever. So I'm still falling, and I'm folding her. I'm behind just falling and folding her stuff. And he's asking me questions, or I'm trying to, you know, and it's just, oh, well. <laughs> and falling gave me all the business. I just stayed with that, and it it gave me everything, everything I needed to do. So, mm. yeah. And oh, that question. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay. Do you think the the checkup technique is uh, only for actors, or do you think, in your opinion, also directors should be familiar or even learn it? And if yes. How can a director profit? So, I am now in the phase of really wanting to reach out to directors to get them to direct using the checkoff technique. And um, my feeling is that the uh, growth of checkoff actors and the increasing availability of checkoff actors is going to make it possible for a higher quality of performance to happen, but it cannot happen until we have directors who can lift it, who can hold the overview and lift it with the same directorial awareness of higher consciousness. Um, we need, it's the next most important thing to do is train directors to be able to lift the work of the Chekhov trained actors and directors who can very quickly give a non Chekhov trained actor a few Chekhov suggestions to fix some problems that come up in a healthy way emotional life, contact, connection, atmosphere. Atmosphere, I feel, is the single most absent element um, today. Clint Eastwood is a Chekhov director. Clint Eastwood's films are packed with powerful atmospheres. He is the director on film who is most masterful at Michael Chekhov's work with gesture and atmosphere. And I, I feel that comes through in his writing and his producing and his directing and his acting. And um, the, the work that I've been doing on synth analysis is designed to help actors and directors lift the checkoff material um, to, to merge the system of analysis with uh, checkoff to get the analysis synthesized through checkoff. And one of the problems with the checkoff technique in general is that many people who went on to teach what Michael Chekhov taught did not realize that Mr. Chekhov did not teach the system of analysis. And he did not teach it because he felt it was really good. And what he was doing was working with it, and he was teaching what wasn't being taught already. So, as the as Chekhov's work moved further away from people who were already trained in that system, 
his students who just taught what he taught did not bring it into application and communion with the analysis. So you wound up with a bunch of people who didn't know truly how to apply it, how to merge it. And so uh, I was lucky to work with Mala Powers, who was the executor of Michael Chekhov's estate. She was the only film star who was coached privately by him who went on to teach. And we worked together for 18 years. Mr. Chekhov knew she didn't have the system of analysis. So he gave her a certain information that he didn't give anyone else who went on to teach in any case, right? So, so we got some insights through Mala about how he was working with his own perspective on analysis and, and ways into it. And, and one of the things uh, that's very interesting is uh, a concept called palaces, which is very useful for, uh, can be very useful for actors and directors. And that is a, a process of crossing a threshold into a multi-dimensional space and exploring in your imagination room after room after room or, or space after space after space around a certain theme. You could step in as yourself or as the character, but you could go in to a palace of yearning as the character and imagine that you walk down a corridor and open a door and in that room is some revelation of the character's yearning and they, they experience that and then you turn and there's another door and a whole other experience of that character's yearnings and or their fear and or their uh, their, their field of beauty or whatever you baptize the palace as. And this becomes a, an alternative to writing a character biography. You no longer need a character. You don't need to write some story about the character. Writing a character biography doesn't mean anything unless what you've written shows up in the physical body as a movement or a sound in some expression. If it doesn't show up in the characterization or in the emotional life, in the behavior, then it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter if your father was a fisherman. It doesn't matter how much money you decide you had. It doesn't matter what you decide happened to the character written there unless it is somehow influencing how the character expresses itself in the story being told right now. And the palace is something that can feed you with this deep, rich um, experience where beyond words, beyond words, beyond anything you can write, you, you suddenly have a connection and a knowingness of the, about the character. So little things like that that we wouldn't have without Mala. Um, and, and when a director can bring these into uh, a, a rehearsal with Chekhov trained actors who are able to work with it, the potential is, is great. I, I will say, I directed a play, a short one act, and I brought it into a, a TV station and I shot it on three cameras. I had seven actors. One of them had been, no, two of them, sorry, two of them had been on camera before. Um, two of them had never acted before, and the other three had only acted on stage. And I spent $500 filming this, total budget, and edited it. I, I created all my camera angles using the Chekhov technique, directed it with the atmospheres, edited it, at, added the music with the Chekhov technique in mind, and that little 
film, 26 minute film, was a finalist in the American Film Institute National Video Contest. It was lifted out of the low budget category mm -hmm. up to a higher budget. It was in competition with a, 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 a public broadcasting film with Christopher Reeve, Yosef Summer, and Roxanne Hart, and um, Maureen Stapleton. It, with helicopter shots and uh, you know all sorts of things and my little $500 film was accorded the same respect nationally with actors who right? and it's just the check it was because I just followed the principles and used the ideas and 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 it worked so you can take a project that and magnify its impact by directing with it. And the only way the acting of Michael Chekhov can grow is with if the directing skills grow so that they can work together. And the writers need to be coming into that mix. And the producers. And the designers. So, the ultimate, ultimate power, my belief is Chekhov's theater of the future is, a, is applicable for film, television, for all entertainment, all entertainment, that, uh, that it permeates the spectator on levels beyond the conscious self and uplifts and induces a, a healing in some way. And to do that, we have to be trained on a higher level. And we need to have the intent to, to want to do that. And, and for a full feeling of the whole, the, the whole will always be greater than the sum of its parts. And when you get all the parts check off oriented, and united in a vision, you have something that is extremely power powerful beyond the combination of the ingredients. So, yeah. What was the name of the film? It's called Ecclesian Catches Light. And I'm not sure if I've put it on YouTube, but I've been thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Other questions? Other thoughts? Maybe a few, a few words about your video collection? Yes. Um, I have been collecting video on the subject of Michael Chekhov since 1991. I produced the uh, 100th birthday salute of Michael Chekhov at the American Film Institute in Hollywood. And I had uh, Mal Powers and Beatrice Strait and Ford Rainey and myself. And I bought uh, my first really good video camera and began taping from there. And I brought my camera to the 1992 conference and the 1993 in Moscow, 94 in um, England, and 95 back in Berlin. And uh, from those events, I have interviews, for example, in, um, in England, uh, we invited a number of Michael Chekhov studio students, direct students, and we did panels. So everyone who was there from the Dartington years, uh, we, had an, we had an interview with all of them talking about their experiences. Everyone who was in Ridgefield, everyone who was in Hollywood. We had lectures from various scholars, and, and I have videos of as many of the different teachers as I could get same in, in Russia, and, um, and I have much of the uh, conference in 90, 
95, about 40 hours of the conference in 95. So I have several hundred hours. Plus I, during that time, interviewed as many, uh, as many of my teachers as I could still find, uh, which included Beatrice Strait, Eddie Grove, um, uh, Deirdre Hurst Dupre, and, and Ford Rainey, Heard Hatfield, um, Felicity, uh, I didn't get Felicity, I studied with Felicity, but I, she, she wasn't available, um, Eleanor Faison, and I, uh, and Mala Powers, and George Donoff, and Jack Colvin, and um, Anthony Quinn, and uh, Lloyd Bridges and his wife Dorothy Bridges and Phil Brown who uh, played Michael Chekhov's role in Inspector General in 1946 in Hollywood and was Uncle Owen in Star Wars and um, John Barry who directed Michael Chekhov in Cross My Heart who was blacklisted and was a I think he's a Palme d'Or winning director who lived in Paris and um, was a student in the Lessons to the Professional Actor uh, series in the 40s and uh, Vincent Sherman who directed him in In Our Time with Ida Lupino and uh, of course I had, uh, uh, was, spent time with Gregory Peck who narrated um, from Russia to Hollywood. So I put much of that footage together to help create the first documentary on Michael Chekhov called From Russia to Hollywood. And that is available on Amazon Prime. And, and um, that footage also, uh, I interviewed Leslie Caron in Paris and um, uh, William Elmhurst, Beatrice's brother at Dartington Hall and um, uh, contributed footage to uh, Michael Chekhov, The Darnington Years, which was put together by Martin Sharp, and also to the Michael Chekhov documentary that Planeta 4 in Russia put together. About a third of that footage it comes from my collection. And I have collected video of uh, my complete course and multiple videos of various sections of uh, my 70-hour course. I also fully documented a production of, of Mice and Men that I directed. And I videotaped everything from the producers meeting agreement to do the production, interviewing designers, the casting, all the rehearsals and eight performances doing following the the whole process so that's that's hundreds of hours also and i have all the raw tape of uh, uh, of for example i did a tv show with beatrice and ford rainey and mala in the studio and I was going to direct it from the booth, but Beatrice was already starting to become uh, forgetful. And she got a little nervous when I kept trying to go back into the booth. So I wound up just pulling a chair in. And, <laughs> and we have, uh, well, we just let the cameras roll. And we have an isolated camera just on her. And we have, so I have, you know, a stack of tapes uh, about that with some fascinating information. When I interviewed Deirdre Hurst Dupre, who wrote down every word that Michael Chekhov said from 1935 until 1942, um, and she was very close friends with Eleanor Faison, so we brought Eleanor over to interview her in the morning. We prepared lunch, had Deirdre come, and had lunch with Mala, Deirdre, Eleanor, myself, and um, and a friend of Deirdre's, and I just rolled the camera on the whole lunch, mm. and and then we shot 
Deirdre's interview. So uh, I also interviewed Georgette Boner, who produced The Castle Awakening in Paris and um, wrote, did the translation of uh, to the actor in German and uh, homage on Akhtar, um, her own book, and uh, interviews with Anatoly Smelyansky, Marina Ivanova, and uh, a number of, of people in uh, at, at the Russian conference, interviews with uh, researchers and things like that. So it is, I have about 25 cartons. Uh, I also have two drawers this wide full of the documents, the faxes, the tracking the evolution of this process from 92 through um, 99, when uh, in 98 uh, I created the first international workshop in the United States, and then again in 99. And it was at the end of the 1999 international workshop when I withdrew from producing the international workshops, and I asked Joanna Merlin to take over that that area and with the support of Jessica Cerullo who was my intern in 98, my producer in 99 at the O'Neill, um, that they then with Ted Pugh and Andre Malayev Babel uh, took that and created the Misha organization from there. So, wow. yeah, so I have massive amounts of history and material and I'm hoping to place it in a worthy archive. Mm -hmm. I, and I, it would be great to get funded to be able to edit some of these and make more of them available as they are. Um, fascinating. But the, fast, the, the, the thing is that you need to digitize it really. Yes, I did, I did get what I think are the 200 most important hours at least put on DVD from the original tapes, so. I have that. Yes, it's a big job. Mm. I could imagine a really amazing book as well. Some of that could be transcribed. It would be an amazing yes. book. Yes, yes. Volumes of yes. books. Yes. I would like the, a little video series to be sort of like inside the actor's studio, but it's mm -hmm. Life and Encounters with Michael Chekhov. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, Beatrice Strait's Life and Encounters, Ford Rainey's Life and Encounters, Anthony Quinn's Life and Encounters. Mm. Lisa, you've been such an advocate for a Chekhov. Have you ever approached like the Juilliards or the main drama schools to say all that you have and to kind of share mm -hmm. it with these, I mean, I don't know, Tisch Drama Department of 1,400 students a year coming in to study Adler and Meisner and yeah. Stanislavski? Well, um, they, when I was studying in New York at Beatrice's studio, uh, the studio had a contract with NYU uh, so it was one of the four places where they came, and um, and then the studio sort of fell apart. But through that, Joanna Merlin did go on to the uh, and and does bring the Chekhov work in there. So it's it's definitely in there. But it's still not one of the you know one of the main ones that they dishes. learned. It's not the main dish for the no, first it's second not um, because what the what the school does is they farm it out to a studio, and there is no studio that can handle it, that can handle it, so, so it doesn't happen. And the, the plain fact of the matter is, we go back to that question of commercialism and economics and who has to make a living. I was blessed to make a living as an actor, you know, that's, that's how I made my living, that's how I bought the camera, you know, it's how I came to Berlin when I, 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 spent my money going to Europe for the first time with my husband on a, you know, 30, 30 days, if this is Tuesday, it must be Belgium, and we spent way more money than we meant to. And, you know, when I knew about the, the, the conference uh, before I left, it, I, I was like, I can't go because I, I've already bought this trip. And I came home from one month and I opened my mailbox and I had $10,000 worth of residuals from commercials. Mm -hmm. And I 
called up Mala and I said, Mala, I want to go. And Mala reached out to Jorg and Jobst and they said, yes, she can come. And I slept on her floor. And, hmm. and, and you know, that's how we met. And, um, and so my, my work, my ap applying Michael Chekhov's work to my acting is what provided me the means to study uh, in New York when I was studying. I could study anywhere, pay as much money as I wanted because I was using it as a stunt woman, I was using it as an actor, and I was using it as a clown, comedian, and impersonator. And I was making a lot of money off of it. And it changed my whole being as a spiritual person. I, I came into it pretty much atheistic. I was, I had a very difficult life uh, in, in many respects. And, and you know, it, that God wouldn't do that to me. So through Michael Chekhov's work, it opened me up. And I knew, I knew I had to, I had a different calling. I knew I had a different calling. I was always a teacher. I was always a teacher. So I was, I was teaching in New York. I was teaching, I was doing stunt workshops. I was teaching clown. I was teaching circus skills. I was teaching other acting techniques. But Chekhov became the hmm. thing that healed and united all the different processes. And it, and I mean, yeah, I made a living as an actor. I never made a living as a teacher. Never have. And I realized at a certain point in 2005 that I had turned down a number of film parts to meet my desire to teach. I turned down movies. I turned down a commercial when I came in 92. I turned down a film when I went to Russia in 93. I turned down about seven film roles. And one day I sat down and went, you know, you you were you're giving up acting roles to go teach in, in you know at places that have no money have no budget they can pay your rent i mean you they can pay your airfare give you some food and that's a higher priority once i figured out my deeper values then i was able to uh, come to a, a reckoning with myself <laughs> and, uh, and created a life where I did not need to work anymore and could just teach mm. for and, and not worry about what I was generating. So That's a blessing. Very, very great blessing. And, I, and the greatest blessing, my greatest blessing was my husband. It's absolutely my greatest blessing. He was the staunchest supporter. He believed in me and believed in everything that I did and he gave me complete freedom and complete support to, to be who I was and, and deeply loved me, deep, deeply unconditionally. And, and you could see his video. He became an actor just by sleeping with a stunt woman. <laughs> <laughs> and his demo is on um, YouTube, Ken Kerman. Uh, it's, it, and I've written the checkoff tools that he's using, superimposed them on his film clips. Mm -hmm. And so you can see what he's using. And mm -hmm. his name is Ken Kerman, K-E-R-M-A-N and you can look him up on IMDb, and you can look at his credits on IMDb, which I hope you all know are never all the work that you've done, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff missing, but 
just keep in mind he didn't start acting till he was 50 years old. Fifty. Fifty. Yeah. As you look at what he did. Yeah. With Chekhov. <laughs> Never too late. <laughs> Never too late. <laughs> Other questions? Pardon? Voice dialogue. Voice dialogue. Yeah, it's Yeah. Oh, yeah, we should wrap it up. But there is, um, it, for me, the second most um, transformative work that. Uh, affected my life as a whole was gifted to me from Mala Powers. Uh, it's the work of Hal Stone and Sidra Winkleman Stone called Voice Dialogue, and it's a process of uh, identifying subpersonalities and allowing them to speak in their pure forms. And Mala felt this was could be extremely helpful if done carefully and properly for actors to, in effect, um, open up parts of themselves that they have blocked uh, from expressing in their everyday life. And when a character would need that energy, if the actor has blocked that energy out of their everyday life, that actor will be unlikely to be able to render the the character happily, as Mr. Chekhov would say. The actor will not be happy because they can't fully reveal that character because the character is needing to express a disowned energy. And through this process of allowing that disowned energy to express itself, it, in a safe environment, it can be reintroduced into the health of the actor. And uh, Mala studied for seven years with uh, Drs. Hal and Cedra Stone and was very well trained. And I studied with Hal and Cedra also, and not the, to the depth that she did, uh, but both Mala and I uh, developed the skills to be practitioners or facilitators with the work and the work definitely helped me transform areas of my life and relationships. And one of those that was very interesting and relevant to teaching, very important, was that um, I, because of the difficulties of my um, biography, was um, very codependent. If I coached you in a scene and you went and auditioned and you were terrible, it was my fault. And I was, uh, my sense of value came only if my students did well. And I, and through voice dialogue, I was able to let that go and realize that I offer you a gift it's the best I can do, and if you are able to use it, that's because you've chosen to use it. It's out of your freedom. You have the freedom to do with the gift. If, if I took this stunning gift that Jorg gave me and threw it on the ground, it would not mean that the gift meant anything less. Right? It would not diminish Jorg in any way. It would have been what I chose to do with it out of my freedom. <laughs> I'm going to do that, of course. But uh, just I had to learn that if I gave myself to, to someone who did not use it, that that was not a reflection of my value. And that was a very uh, important learning. And when I was severely crippled from a stunt and couldn't walk and was bedridden and went from being Superman to a cripple, um, 
voice dialogue helped me cope with the major shift of personality and identity. So it is um, also very interesting to be able to blend it with psychological gesture. And, and uh, when you were asking about the use of Chekhov for directing, for me, Chekhov is a, a technique for life. And uh, I, I've developed a, a, a thing called power gestures which is applying PG, psychological gesture, to human health and development using the, uh, the win, loss, and um, uh, transition gesture, the trigger, the transition, the transformation. Using that, finding these through voice dialogue, and then creating move, the movement to uh, release the, the pain and train your body to be able to grow into the victory so that your body, your, your neurological patterns reprogram themselves and say, yes, I can do this. And uh, there is a sort of like a little TED talk that is on YouTube that I did about power gestures. And um, that is under the name of the 2017 Epi E-I-P-P-Y book awards, because I was getting a, an award for um, uh, my book, um, Falling for the Stars, The Stunt Gals, Tattletales. And they asked me to present uh, at, and speak at this conference. So I find it very useful for healers, uh, for coaches, for self-development. And in fact, uh, in 90, Five, when I came for the Berlin conference here, I stayed with Jorg, and every morning we decided to make a psychological gesture for ourselves to help us through the day because it was quite chaotic and it was very powerful, very effective. So it, there's, a, there's a TED Talk, it's second or maybe even now first most watched TED Talk by Amy Cuddy, C-U-D-D-Y, on power poses. Mm -hmm. And she's speaking about how just taking a pose will transform your energy and give you a boost. Power gestures, psychological gestures <laughs> for human health and development, take power poses and multiply because it leads you to transformation. It's not just a temporary shot of adrenaline. It goes into the wound and helps you detoxify that and transform it. Transform your pain into your gain through um, a psycho-spiritual process. So that's a whole other area of development waiting to unfold. Another book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.